Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I am Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and our friend Brian Broom, and today we're talking about the Trinity. Uh, so the Trinity is like an apple, right? That's modalism, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I just wanted to make sure we could get all of the St. Patrick's bad analogies out of the way <laughs> before we really got got started. I was just saying to David that like we're all going to get to heaven and meet Hans Feeney and be like, dude, you're the guy who made the Lutheran satire, like St. Patrick, that was hilarious, right? And he's going to be like, I was also a pastor and like <laughs> was faithful in leading, feeding God's sheep and all this. And we're going to be like, that's modalism, Patrick. <laughs> and just that's what it's going to be like, I'm pretty sure. You might want to explain to whoever's listening what in the world you're talking about. Oh, what? Haven't we linked this enough times already? So there is a video called Lutheran, a video by Lutheran satire called St. Patrick's Bad Analogies, in which these two little cartoon Irish guys meet St. Patrick, and they ask him to explain the Trinity, and he gives them a bunch of analogies. And we discover They're that none of those analogies bad. are very good. Yeah, they all, not only do they fall short, they give you distinctly wrong ideas. That's the end of that story. Okay, good explanation. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've got that out of the way, this uh, we've been talking about the Trinity now on and off, I think from the beginning. I think it was Calvin who said that if one presumes to speak about God and does not begin with the Trinity, he has nothing but a flutter in the brain. And there's a good deal of truth in that. Our, our, our world has come to the point, America has come to the point, where you say, God, and you think everyone understands who this God person is. Uh, we have theism and deism and pantheism and polytheism and pantheism. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, one God, many gods, all's God, no gods. Um, and we never stop and, and, and think that the God of Scripture is not like these other gods. He condescends to acknowledge our blindness and unbelief and call our our objects of worship, gods. But he spends a good deal of time, particularly Isaiah 40 through 66, come to mind, making the point that they're not at all like him. Not in conception, not in reality. God is unique. The God of the Bible is not like other gods. And so far, we've spent a lot of time talking about God as creator, God's absolute distinction from his creation. He is not it, it is not he, and all that. But what must come immediately with that is the doctrine of the Trinity. We've talked about God's unity, simplicity. There is one God. He does not come in pieces and parts. And now we, as we've been doing, we reaffirm that nonetheless, in this one God, who is one in essence, there are three, and, and the church fathers and those who followed have used the word persons. The Bible doesn't use that word, but it speaks of each of these persons in words that, to the modern 20th century, 21st century person, sounds like person. The Father, <laughs> the Son, the Spirit, and they are described each as thinking, planning, intending, communicating. They're described as choosing, willing, acting, and they're described as uh, loving, uh, being grieved, experiencing joy, delighting to the human mind. That sounds an awful lot like a person. And so this being so, the church, the church struggled initially and still sometimes struggles to try to find the right words to explain what the Bible's telling us. Before we go there, and it's a well-trod pad, we're not going to say anything that the church hasn't said for 2,000 years and said it over and over again, we're not innovators. But I think this is a good point to answer those who would say, well, why can't we just say what the Bible says and leave it at that? Because you start introducing words like subsistence and hypostasis and person. Those aren't biblical terms. Let's just use the Bible's language. And there are very good reasons that we, we actually depart from the Bible's language. We use words like Trinity, which, yeah, it's not in the Bible. Well, why do we do that? It, it is the standard performance of heretics to come to biblical language and say, hmm, if I redefine 
the argument, redefine the key terms, say that, oh, for instance, faith means faith plus works, or that one God means three gods, or you get the idea. Then I can smuggle in my personal beliefs that no one's ever thought of before, but they're obviously true because I thought of them. And uh, I can just keep quoting biblical language all day long, and I'm fine. When I was a kid, I answered the doorbell, and there were these relatively nice ladies standing there, and they wanted to tell me about our world and how it was ending soon. And I said, you know, be, be, before we talk at all, we, we, we need to settle something. Who is Jesus? And the lady who was taking the lead said something along the lines, oh, he's the son of God. He's the only begotten of the Father. He is the image of the invisible God. He is Emmanuel. He is light. He is life. He is truth. And I finally, I said, stop. <laughs> I said, is he Jehovah? Oh, no. Okay, now we know where we are. Or rather, you know that I know where you are. And we can have a conversation, a very brief one at that point, because what she was doing was using the language of Scripture, no doubt as she had been taught, to blur the conversation, because she or those behind her had redefined every single scriptural term to mean something that was consistent with their system of unbelief. And it wasn't until I stepped out of the language of Scripture and cast it in different language, although obviously the word Jehovah or Yahweh is scriptural. Uh, but there is no verse in Scripture that says exactly Jesus is Yahweh. There are a lot of things that come awfully close. There's a ton of stuff that implies it, but those exact words aren't there. So as long as I didn't ask, ask those exact words, she had fallback plans and carefully planned lines of retreat that she could uh, move along, all the while sounding very, very biblical. This wasn't so much, well, I guess it was, with respect to the nature of the Trinity, but more with regard to, to um, salvation. Uh, about a year or two ago, there were some nice girls from, I think, New Zealand uh, on our porch. They were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Mm. And I've dealt a little with Mormons before, so I thought I knew where to go. And I asked them, how many gods are there? There's only one. Really, there aren't any other. No, there's just one God. Huh, hmm. this is a different kind of Mormonism. How about Jesus? Well, he's the son of God. So is he, I don't remember what they answered. So is he God? I don't remember what they answered, but it wasn't, it wasn't what I expected. And as I went down, all right, well, let's move along to different lines. What, what must I do to be saved? And what they gave me, or what we, I didn't ask it that yet. It was something more along, tell me about salvation. And what they gave me was a collection of very biblical language. They had redemption and salvation and propitiation and justification and regeneration. And had I not known who they were, I would have been, I would have been confessed they were evangelicals. Mm -hmm. And it finally came to the point where I said, all right, stop. Let's, let me ask you one simple question. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of your sins and join the church and give money and abstain from these vices. <laughs> And, and it kept going. Well, okay, hold it. We got. It. Let's talk about how paltry your idea of salvation is, because how paltry mm -hmm. your view of sin is, because of how paltry your view of God is. But we we continue to see this, and and the, the these two major cults I think have probably undergone a facelift in the last five years or so, because they are sounding more and more evangelical to the point of dressing different. Uh, the 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 older forms of their come on. People are getting used to, I mean, when Saturday Night Live back in the, what was it, the 80s can do Mormon jokes or Jehovah's Witness jokes, and everybody laughs because we all know how annoying these people can be at the door. It was high time for them to, uh, to change their image. I don't know if they went to Madison Avenue and asked for advice or not. But the same basic uh, patterns hold. Let's take the language of Scripture. Let's redefine it and go from there. Now, of course, that only works in the abstract. If you actually sit down with these people and work through a book in context where they aren't as easily able to slip in their definitions, that's going to be a little different. But in casual conversation, it is a whole lot easier to say, do you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity than it is to try to nail them down from particular scriptural language? you believe in Jesus is the Son of God? Well, of course we do. Really? What does that mean to you? 
And so we, we, this, this is something we're dealing with right off the bat. We're, you're using the language of creeds. You're using the language of the church. Why not just stick to the language of the Bible? Even as late as Newton, Newton was some kind of semi-Aryan or something. But he used exactly the same kind of escape. Mm-hmm. Let's not, I, I confess everything the Bible has to say about Jesus Christ. But let's use that language and not the language of Greek philosophy. In other words, if we, if you hold me, hold my feet to the fire of the creeds, I'm going to come out looking like a flaming heretic. So let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's. Sounds like Milton as well. Uh, was, yeah, Milton was, was yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my eldest daughter, Emily, has a, um, I was about to say love-hate affair with Milton, but no, it's purely one-sided. She does not like Milton <laughs> at all for exactly those reasons. Uh, the fact that she was told over and over again that he's this great Puritan theologian did not help because of sim- simply <laughs> reading Milton, because she can read, uh, she's come away just absolutely not wanting anything to do with Milton. Well, the funny thing about Milton, though, is that like he would go both ways on it. Like mm. He would use that argument with scripture, like we should just use sp- spiritual language. But then he would also redefine Arianism to make it sound like he wasn't one. Yeah. <laughs> So. Yeah, that actually that actually makes a lot more sense now because I had to read through that in a British literature class. I shouldn't have done it at Sierra, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and basically, one of the passages is like, "Oh well, it looks like they they ate of the apple and they sinned." And then it's like, "Ah, oh, you're right. That's what's that's what's going on down there." Who, who's gonna Who's gonna save him? And then Jesus shows up. And is like, I will do it. It's like, oh, that's weird. They're separate. I will take the ring to Mordor. <laughs> oh. oh no! <laughs> I who was like, uh, yeah, I had until you stole it with that literary reference. Oh, I had sorry. another literary reference that was almost as good. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Intercepted. Yeah, I can't remember what it was now. So you may have to chop this part up. So yeah, G- Jesus stands forth and says, "I will, I will be the savior. I will be, I will be the one." Wasn't this like planned or something from eternity? Um, we wonder. <laughs> and we were kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but it's a good, it's a good time and place to do it because a lot of people will ask, "All right, does it really matter? Isn't this overly technical, overly philosophical?" I mean, as long as I believe that Jesus is my Savior and that there's one God, isn't that close enough? But if Jesus isn't God, then we have a real problem with him being our Savior. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and then backing up, we, need to, we, we have to answer some real hard questions about who, again, to quote Douglas Adams, who this God person is anyway. And what, what is sin? And why is sin sin? And why are we here? And it's our condition really that bad and do we really need much of a savior can't we just all be good and doesn't isn't that going to fix it when we throw out the doctrine of the trinity we lose the deity of jesus we lose a divine savior we we lose a savior who is god that means on the one hand that god doesn't demand much and we don't owe him much and our problem isn't much of a problem it's apparently relatively easy to fix just stop drinking coca-cola and wear some holy underwear and go door to door and maybe ride some bicycles and you're fine a relatively easy fix there or it may mean that god is so far away and so removed that bridging the gap between deity and humanity is frankly impossible and so we're on our own and anything we want to do religiously to make ourselves feel good is all good and well and words like God and Jesus and gospel become connotation words, as Schaefer would call them. They give us this feeling of some ooh, spiritual kind of thing going on. But in the long run, really don't mean anything rational. We're in some con- some kind of uh, post-Kantian uh, numeral realm where nothing really means anything. But if you get religious experiences out of it, good for you. Uh, we, we no longer have a God who can reveal himself. We no longer have a God who can save us, or even cares to save us, or even really cares what's going on with us. He's in the Bahamas someplace with his feet up, and we're really on our own. So as we come and talk about the Trinity, we need to understand there are profound implications for the simplest things in what we call Christianity. Our faith, our trust, our confidence, our hope, our life, our salvation, heaven. Uh, everything is, is, is hinging here. 
So we're, we're not being uh, obtuse. We're not being overly philosophical. We're talking about the God who made the universe as he has revealed himself. And that's one of the next key things we, we come to. The only reason we can talk about a God who reveals himself is because God reveals himself. He reveals himself, first of all, in the act of the father begetting the son, or to use other scriptural language, the God speaking the divine word, the divine logos. It is God's nature to reveal himself, and he does so eternally in his son. And that being so, this whole idea of revelation, representation, is at the heart of Christianity. And if we don't have that, then we start falling back on some kind of sheer monotheism, which is to say, there's something there. Not person, not someone we can have a relationship, because relationship is not natural to him, she, it, whatever it is. Uh, it's the force. The force. We might as well call it the force. And we can hope that the force is with us, but even if it were, we really wouldn't know what that might mean. Uh, if does it have a dark side? Yeah, it does and yeah, and we're left with that. And what's the and if it does, what's the difference? Mm. Why do we call one dark and one light? And in some of the later Star Wars movie, that becomes a real question. <laughs> uh, what uh, what is this dark light thing anyway? And is it are these any more than names? Hey, anybody seen the seen the Good Omens yet? No, yeah. I have not. Mm-hmm. I haven't. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to. I hope they did a good job with it. But I, I remember a line from the book where Crowley says to Zeraphale, uh, "Good and bad, they're just names. We both know that." As <laughs> as heaven and hell's agents on the scene, they're able to say, "You know, this is just like human bureaucracy or human uh, espionage organizations. We we each have a side, but <laughs> your morality is about as good as ours." So. They're just names. We just, we just have our jobs to do. Let's get on with it. It doesn't ultimately matter. And there's no moral basis. If if the force is light and dark, if God is good and bad, then what do good and bad even mean? So there's all that. Yeah. Well, perhaps this is the point where we say, having having talked kind of around the Trinity, we go back and, and give basic definitions and, and, and some slight history. First of all, we talk about Jesus coming amongst the Jewish people and making outrageous claims like, before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Son, your sins be forgiven you. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Uh, The soldiers come to take him. And he says, whom do you seek? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am, and everyone falls to the ground. We have this and a great deal more throughout the Gospels, where Jesus, in no uncertain terms, to a people who knew there was only one God, and and they either were confused and were, and tried to come to grips with what he was telling them, or they said, you are a blasphemer. We must kill you now. And they would, because they understood that he was they, claiming uh, to be God. They, they understood something of what that meant. It doesn't mean they understood the full doctrine of the Trinity, but they understood. You're making divine claims. You're talking like you're Jehovah, and you're right here, and you're a man, and that's obvious. So we call that blasphemy, and blasphemers ought to be stoned. So we're going to proceed to do that now. Well, even, even before the liberals of the 19th century, you go back to the Enlightenment. You have people who tried to find the historical Jesus. That is, the Jesus who never claimed to be God, never wrought a miracle, and never rose from the dead. Because we want to believe... Boring. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Boring, you know? That is such an excellent critique of that whole movement. Uh, you guys have no imagination in you. are boring. You, you wrote a story where the, the hero of the story comes and tells us, be good and don't run with scissors. And we and we and we killed him, and that was it. You know, that's that's all they got for us, because at that point in the development of Western thought, men still had a really high opinion of themselves, their reason, and their culture. I'm reading a book by um, Carl Becker. It's a series of lectures, real short, and it's taking me forever to get through it. In part because he's it's supposed to be on the heavenly city of the. Uh, 17th, 18th century philosophers. I haven't got to that yet. He's taken half of the thing just to describe how Enlightenment thought 
looked epistemology in the face and concluded in David Hume, we can't know anything. We don't know that there's a God. In fact, we're pretty sure there isn't a God. There's no way to prove it if there were. And uh, any system that, that needs that is right out. And so, and Becker is there just praising this up one side and down the other about how fearless and, <laughs> and ruthless and honest they were. Well, except all those who weren't. And I think that's the rest of the book where he's going to show how they all tried to, all the remaining philosophers tried to create some kind of utopian vision where they were still stealing from Christian capital. You know, again, a world where everybody's nice, everybody's good, we all play well with one another, everybody's happy and loves one another. And if I, I, I see where this is going, I think, he's going to say, well, you just weren't consistent. You did not follow reason to where reason necessarily leads. That is the loss of all absolutes. Now, Becker was writing before the First and Second World War, or before the rise of Marxism, before the Russian Revolution, before Stalin's um, death camps or Hitler's Holocaust, he still thought it was pretty cool to be an atheist and a rationalist. He was wrong. He, he saw that even then people were not really ready to do, to deal with the reality of what happens once you say Jesus is a God. He, he's very sharp in condemning them for not taking where it goes because he, he understood. Uh, we can look at... Um, Thomas Jefferson with his cut and paste New Testament, which he did not call a Bible. It's a history of the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth or something like that, where he went through the New Testament gospels and cut out every miracle, every claim to divinity, everything that would seem to, where Jesus might seem to be elevating himself above common humanity. And of course, it therefore ends with the stone being rolled in front of too, because for Jefferson, Jesus couldn't possibly come back to life. That's not a possibility in a rational universe. But you move from him, and from that time period on into the liberals of the late 19, or late 1800s, early 1900s, who are pursuing their quest for the historical Jesus. It ends in Albert Schweitzer, who pretty much, after surveying the field and showing what everybody's done and suggesting his own ideas, pretty well leaves us with the reality that once you have cut out of the Gospels, every claim to deity, whether direct or indirect, every miracle, the resurrection, you are left with a few fragments that mean nothing. There is no historical Jesus once you remove the Jesus who claimed to be God. And so as the Gospels, as Jesus confronted the Jewish people, and as the Gospels went out into the early world, the early um, Roman world, there was um, very clear what, what, what they were saying. Not all of the T's had been crossed and not all the I's had been dotted, but it was clear that this Jesus was God, that he was the God of the Old Testament. And as the Christians confronted Rome, their first creed was simply, Jesus is Lord, Jesus uh, is Dominum. And that meant something in that culture because Caesar claimed to be Lord. That is to be the unique link between heaven and earth, the Son of God, who by his very person, majesty, and power and authority established the foundations of the empire. You can worship whoever you want. God has many faces and many manifestations, but the one that's central for social purposes is Caesar himself. And that you have to kneel before. If you Christians want to call Jesus Lord after you've called Caesar Lord, we can talk. But we got to get this clear that deity is primarily incarnate and manifest in Caesar as the political and social um, cement that holds the empire together. And so if the Christians hadn't believed that Jesus was God, they could simply have said, oh, wait, wait, we didn't mean that. That's so <laughs> extreme. No, we just meant Lord, like, you know, he's like our captain, our leader, our number one. We kind of go where he goes and does what he does. But God, no, oh, no, we weren't making any kind of claims like that. It would have been very easy to do. And instead of that, the Christians went to the lions and to the stake. They were that convinced that Jesus was God on the basis of what the gospel said. And the heart of that is what Jesus himself had said and what he had done while he was on earth. So we, when we start talking about the Trinity, we are first of all acknowledging that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament that he is the only God there is, and yet, and yet, he calls himself son of God. So there's a distinction. From the beginning, there's this, this unity of essence. He is the true God, and yet 
he speaks of himself as the, as the son, and he speaks of his father. And so once uh, Constantine legalized Christianity, in the Book of Milan 313, very quickly the church had to come to terms with that. So what does that mean? We've got this father person who is God, who sent the son, who begets the son. We have the son who came into our existence, who became Jesus of Nazareth, who lived, who died, who rose again. What's the relationship here? And the first suggestion outside of orthodoxy came from a bishop of Alexandria whose name was Arius. And Arius was a rationalist. He was not an exegete. He did not attempt to exposit scripture to any great extent. He simply looked at what the church was saying and said, this doesn't make sense. We, we, we all agree there's only one God, and yet you say the Father is God, you say the Son is God. That's two gods. I can count. And some of you are saying the Holy Spirit's God. That's three gods. That's, that doesn't make any sense. It's not rational. So tell you what, I got a great idea. Let's just simplify this and rationalize the whole thing, and we will at all admit that the Father is God, the true God, the God of the Old Testament, and that he created and son and adopted him, and that's Jesus. He's the greatest of the creatures, uh, and through him he made all other creatures. And then there's this Holy, Sp Holy Spirit thing, which is like God's active energy of the universe. So there we have it. We have only one God, We and Jesus is his son, and now we have a nice rational religion. Thanks, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of people loved it, and of course the people who loved it most were in the imperial court for a very simple reason. The Caesars, for a very long time, had called themselves sons of God. Arius said that, that the father can't make another son any greater than Jesus, but he can make another son equal to Jesus. And so, well, that sounds good. Jesus was the son of God while he was on earth, but he's gone. Caesar's right here. He can be a son of God. We like this. We can work with this. We can make this play. And so we begin, and, and this is a theme that you all know well. We've talked about this a lot of times in class. That any time you diminish the son, take away his deity, something's going to step into that power vacuum, and that thing is normally the state. Could be it could be a church, could be a cult leader, but more often than not, it is the power state stepping in and saying, "Well, you know, your savior is really far away and kind of irrelevant. He's off in heaven if he even exists, and uh, our guy, our leader, our Fuhrer, our pick a designation." emperor, whatever. He is God's man right now. He incarnates God's purpose and power right now in history. And so we all need to listen to him and do what he says. This, this was a very simple, direct line in the Roman Empire, because here was Caesar, son of God. How, how, how hard is this one? And this means, of course, also that if God can create another son, who, like Jesus, can reveal the Father and do just as good a job as the Father, but be a different revelation, we have now opened the door to multiple gods. So in the name of establishing monotheism, we've generated pan or, um, polytheism. And we've also opened the possibility to all the other religions in the world being true manifestations of the one revelation that God gives in a kind of incoherent manner through all of these sons of his you're probably too young to remember a movie called oh god and starred jo um, george burns of say goodnight gracie he played I haven't heard of that one either ah no you disappoint sorry i have heard of say thank say you goodnight, about gracie. i haven't seen it though so you can still feel disappointment in me as well okay yeah. back in, back in radio days george burns was a very famous uh, radio comedian his prop was a big cigar dark red glasses, and he had an airheaded wife named uh, Gracie, Gracie Allen. And the end of their radio program was always to say, good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. It made it, it, made it over <laughs> to TV. It's funnier if you see it. Anyway, you, cultural <laughs> literacy, you must know this. But uh, this George Burns, he was not, as, as Christians and even as, as nice Americans reckon it, he was not exactly the nicest, most moral of men. But they cast him to play God, and he comes to Earth and and picks up some random, I forget if he's a delivery guy or something, I don't remember anymore, 
uh, and he's he's checking out what people think about him, and he wants people to think more about God. So that he he tells this young man, "I need you to get my gospel across, my message across." What message is that? Think God. And so the whole movie is more or less about this young man coming to terms with he actually is talking to the living God who looks like an old man with a cigar, and trying to get people to think God in the abstract. Not who, we're not told who God is. At one point, the young man finally asked the obvious question, is Jesus Christ your son? And George Burns says, Jesus is my son. Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius, they were all my sons. And there you have it. One God who exists beyond phenomenal categories of description or discussion. God, we can't talk about a God about whom we can say nothing meaningful, somehow drops mystical hints to all kinds of religious leaders who then turn around and tell us, and the fact that their systems aren't identical or even harmonious is irrelevant because that's what God is like. God is himself incoherent. God is himself ineffable to the point that there are no clear messages because he's not a self-revealing God. He's not the God who by nature reveals himself in the Son. He is a God who by nature is hidden. And insert, insert the whole history of neo-Orthodoxy and Bartianism at this point. The hidden God who peeps and mutters and various group uh, cult leaders, religious leaders, pick up on this or that. And so every religion contains some true thing about God, but none of them is clear enough to hang your soul on. And they're all just, well, it's, I like to think of God this way. And the bumper sticker I've mentioned so often, God is too great to be contained in any one religion. Because every religion is man grasping after the unrevealed and unrevealable. Mm -hmm. And we are left with our own ruminations about a religious experience, not any discussion of what God has said. Because God, by definition, is wordless. He does not speak. He has no word. He has no son. So that was Arianism. And as you all know, the church answered that, the Council of Nicaea, Constantine, not the profoundest theologian, but he did understand something that the modern world generally doesn't. Cultures are the product of religion, and the social cement of any culture or society is its professed religion. He knew that if Rome as a civilization was going to survive, they needed to have a single clear cut religion. He called the church together hoping that the church would peaceably patch things up and come up with some kind of compromise. That Enter St. Nicholas. <laughs> Tell us the story of St. Nicholas, Emily. The story of St. Nicholas, the actual St. Nick, is that at the Council of Nicaea, he was so fed up with this garbage heresy that Arius was preaching that he walked across the room and punched him in the face, just decked him right there. And so much for a peaceful resolution. I, I mean, that wasn't the deciding thing, right? But. It, it probably helped. And I, I like to imagine that as he did it, he said, ho, 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 Moses. <laughs> you know, the tragic thing, I hate, to, I hate to, to, to burst your bubbles. It apparently never happened. No. Yeah, yep. I oh. know. I was going to use it in something. And just to double, I, I've learned long ago, double check your sources. <laughs> and I went back mm -hmm. and there are historical not, not from liberals or anybody, just there are real historical constraints that basically say, yeah, that really, that yeah, couldn't have it happened. Too it was to too be good true. to be true. Yeah. I, I think one of them was like, one of the reasons was that St. Nicholas wasn't present while Arius was present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like he was corresponding by letter until he could arrive. Right. Okay. So. Well, I'd like to think that were he there, <laughs> he would have. Exactly. <laughs> So, somehow, I, I I prefer it being apocryphal, just because you know the <laughs> the requirements for elder being non contentious and non quarrelsome. Oh, that's true. I would like Saint oh, Nicholas rats. to be a, an elder in good standing in his oh. church. <laughs> Although my own former pastor, he's uh, retired now, um, was was dealing with some heretics who were visiting our church. This was before I was a member. My wife, as a young girl, was a member at the time. And they were people who denied the resurrection, but they didn't come right out mm. and say that. Of course and, not. and when when it finally became clear, my wife says, and our pastor was so cool, he said that it, he told them if they ever came back, he was going to punch them in the nose. She's very proud of him for that. <laughs> I, I asked him about that. He says, I never said that. Really. <laughs> she, she insists that he gets. I, I, I'm not sure that's true. But, 
you know <laughs> you know stories get the irish are very well familiar because they get more fantastic in the retelling <laughs> isn't that what irish stories are for yes it, yeah. you never let the facts get in the way of a good story exactly that's exactly. it well the other name besides saint saint nicholas that we need to connect with um nicaea saint athanasius he wasn't a saint at that point. He, was, he wasn't even uh, an elder or pastor. He was a deacon of a church in Alexandria. And he'd gone there with a man who was at that point serving as bishop, who was obviously no longer Arius. But he was, he was well known because he had written a book on the incarnation of the Lord, defending Jesus' deity against the Gentiles. Um, he, at the time he wrote it, Arius wasn't exactly on the map, but he, he gave all kinds of good reasons why Gentiles should seriously look at Jesus as true deity. So he was known, and he was the one who really pushed and pushed for an orthodox resolution. Now, Arius, on the other hand, found out, much to his chagrin, that his position was not very popular. His position was, Jesus isn't God, he's a creature. He is so a creature, he is so not God, that we, we shouldn't even be going there. And, and, and the church, the other bishops, by, by and large, were, no, that, we, that's not right. But they were hesitant to go fully in the orthodox direction, and they, they stopped halfway, which is to say nowhere close, by saying, well, what happens if we say not that Jesus is of one essence with the Father, but that he's of like essence with the Father? In other words, whatever it is that makes one God, Jesus is and has that. But the implication mm. is he's not the same God the Father is. He's just another God who's made of the same God stuff. I, there's no way you can say it. It's not absolutely heretical. But mm -hmm. it sounded good. And in Greek, the two words are off by a letter, single letter, an I, an iota. Homoousian, of one essence. Homoousian, of like essence. And by and large, most of the bishops were favoring the compromise, which is how it was presented. Uh, we, we, we were not going anywhere near Arius, but to, to insist that, that the Father and Son together are one God, one essence, one substance, that's, that's hard. That stretches our reasons. It makes our head ache. Let's just stop short of that and saying that Jesus is just so like God. The Son is like God. He is as like God as you could possibly imagine. And it looked for a while like um, orthodoxy was going down the drain. God in his sense of humor stirred up one of Arius, uh, Arius's companions, one of the guys, one of his lackeys, I don't remember the guy's name, uh, who for some reason got it all backwards and decided that the whole council was, was following Athanasius, and Athanasius was going to vote for Athanasius. <laughs> and so he asked that before the council make its final vote and termination on how they were going to phrase all this, that he be allowed to speak. And the council figured, and what's the harm at this point? And they granted it to him, and he spoke. And largely what he said was, you, you need to understand that what Athanasius is saying, that Jesus is truly and fully God, is just an absolute heresy because Jesus is a creature. He is absolutely a creature. He is not anywhere near being God. He is so far from being God. He's like anti-God. He's just not even in the ballpark or the stadium or the city for being God. And as the more he talked, the more people kind of hunkered down under seats and covered their faces and looked like they weren't there. So that when the vote came up, people basically were saying, uh, well, I may not be comfortable with Athanasius, but if that's Arius, I'm going to distance myself as far as possible. And so they voted to confess that Jesus, that the Son, is of the same essence, of one essence, homoousian, with the Father. God from God, light from light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father. And you, and, and often when we're, when we're teaching church history, to young people, we, we, we give the impression, and so they lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> what actually happened is everybody went home and said, what did we do there? Uh, it sounds like some of our senators and congressmen, after, after all the bills they rushed through just before Christmas time, what were we thinking? <laughs> Why did we vote for that one? And, and, and so they began to complain and to gripe. And so it was Athanasius. He twisted our arms. He pushed us. He rushed us. We, 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 what's wrong with, with being like the Father? That's, that's good enough. That's accurate enough. We, we'll just kind of ignore what, we, what Nicaea did. We'll go on talking about Jesus being of like essence with the Father. And it took an entire generation for younger theologians to go back and, and do the basic work. All right, let's define person. 
subsistence, socia, hypostasis. Let's define all these words. Let's come up with better analogies, if only to show that they don't work. Uh, let's do the exegesis. <laughs> and so by the time we, a generation has passed and we get to the Council of Constantinople in, what was it, 381? that we're ready to do, we're ready to go at this again. And this time there is agreement. This time, yes, Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is God, although they avoid the language of psychology and philosophy, go directly to, he's the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. So we're going to say he's God. We're just going to do it in different ways that avoid some of the controversial language. It would not be until sometime later that the phrase proceeds from the Father. And the son would be added. We will talk about that later. I have a friend who we, we bonded over the fact that when we say the Nicene Creed in church, we both get really emphatic when it comes to and the son oh, because too, we know you? why it's there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of my friends do that. I, I've done that for a long time. I have written two articles. One, one originally was a web article for Cal the Calcedon Foundation. The other was it was basically the same all uh, article retooled for the seminary uh, church history magazine Leben, 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 on the doctrine of the double procession, and I think it made me at least a few enemies in the Greek Orthodox community. One thing, oh, I, yeah. One thing I found out though, as I was doing my initial research, is that the number of Reformed Presbyterian voices out there on the Philippe clause was somewhere approaching zero. In fact, the best article that I found, that was just a wonderful article, was written by, and I don't remember the gentleman's name, but it was by a Pentecostal pastor who had been doing missionary work of some sort, I believe, in, in Russia. And of course, Ooh, wow. you know, as a Protestant in Russia, you're going to be dealing with this issue. And he did a, he did a fine <laughs> yeah. job and quoted him all over the place. I don't know if the articles, if his article is still available online or not, but maybe we can come back to that later. So anyway, at this point, somewhere in here, Augustine had, had spoken of the of the Trinity, Tertullian uh, had used those words, so that the, the, the word Trinity was coming to have definition in terms of the creeds of the church. And what the church, you know, well, the, the, the final frosting of the cake, I suppose, was the Athanasian Creed, which appeared mm, about 300 years later, give or take 400 years. Uh, we don't know who wrote it, but it received extensive use in the West and in Reformation churches later. The East, no, because it speaks directly of the procession of the Holy Spirit from the from the Son. But it it's very long, thorough, thoughtful, yes, boring exposition of the doctrine of the Trinity. And if uh, Emily, it would be good in our show notes to include a copy. I would say not just a, a link to one, but maybe if you can do it, put the whole creed there. Uh, we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. Uh, profound summary, really basic. This is what we need to teach our children. The two basic mistakes that we can make with regard to the Trinity is we can confound the persons. That is, say, these three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, are really just one person. And from there, we can say that the names represent three offices, three phases, three modes of existence. And we all say, that's modalism, modalism. Patrick. Patrick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's also called Sabellianism, but that, that's one easy, logical way. Uh, it's the same person. He just has three different hats or offices or badges. or. And he talks to himself really strangely yeah, in the Garden of Gethsemane <laughs> and some other places. He, he does suffer from multi -per multiple, per multiple personality disorder, it sounds like. Uh, or on the other hand, we can divide God into three gods so that each of them is a God. And they're all together are members of this club called God, but they are three completely different persons, not just distinct, but separate. And here Patrick would say this is partialism. Yeah, revisited. partialism revisited. This is partialism. <laughs> three parts to God. So we sin, and it is sin. It is heresy uh, when we erase the distinction of persons and blend God back into a single person, a kind of simplified monotheism, where God is no longer has personality, even as an attribute. It is not na natural for God to relate to another person. That's either a deficiency in who he is. He needs someone to talk to. He doesn't have anyone. He needs someone to love. 
best makes us. Or simply, he never needed that, and he's more, more or less just a force. Or we end up with something like Mormonism, where there are many gods. Three that we know of, but hey, there can be more, because why not? We're back to polytheism again. That hasn't been the preferred uh, method of heretics until Mormonism. As far as I can, I can tell, mostly we either deny the deity of the Son and Spirit, or we try to blend them together into a single person and still claim it somehow to be orthodox. The Athanasian Creed goes on and tells us how we are to distinguish the three persons. And it's very similar to what will appear a thousand years later in the Westminster Standards. The Father is of none, neither created nor begotten. And the Son is of the Father alone, not created, but begotten. And the Holy Spirit is of the Father and the Son, not created nor begotten, but proceeding. And so we speak of their personal properties. The thing that distinguishes the Father from the Son is the Father begets the Son. He's the Father, the Son's the Son. The thing that distinguishes the Son from the Father is He's the Son. He's begotten. And uh, the Holy Spirit is spirated, breathed, because that's what spirit means, wind or breath. He proceeds forth. He is breathed forth spirated by the Father and the Son. When, when my article first appeared in the, in the Chalcedon website, I got I got an email from someone who was obviously Greek Orthodox, although it took me a couple of exchanges to figure that out. It was a little slow. And he was just kind of slowly, well, what do you mean by this? And could that mean this? And beginning to wonder. Listen, I think I answered that. Um, hmm. And finally he asked, well, what's, what then is the difference between how the the father um, how the son the, how the spirit proceeds from the father and how he proceeds from the son? And I said, well, one, I don't have much of an answer because the Bible doesn't really tell us. But I suppose you could say that the spirit proceeds from the father as one proceeding from the father, and from the son as one proceeding from the son. <laughs> beyond that, that's all you can <laughs> say, man. Yeah, beyond that. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that we're allowed to say a whole lot. The amazing, one of the very many amazing things about this is that God tells us so little about this, this relationship, this eternal existence that is the Trinity. There's so little there, and yet it is profound with meaning and application. And I think that's probably where we need to, to begin to take our discussion. Uh, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's start with this whole idea of, of begotten. It sounds like a temporal world temple word, that is. So the son had a beginning. No, he's eternally begotten of the Father. Well, how does that work? I don't know. <laughs> well, you should be able to explain this. Not really, no, because I can't explain God, so why would I be able to explain this? I can repeat what the Bible has said. And notice very, very early in our discussion here, we are falling back on faith. We are saying two things. One, God can tell us true things that we have some degree of of comprehension. We can, we can, we, we know what a father is. We know what a son is within our experience. We have this idea of begetting. We also know that that's not exactly what he's saying. And there we stop. We cannot rationalistically deduce any further. God tells us true things and they are true, but they are not exhaustive. He does not tell us everything. And the place of faith is to be content with this and to say, yes, Lord, and not to say, but I want to know more because we will look at the pages of Scripture and see there is no more. And we need to humble ourselves and realize that the whole Christian life is going to be like this. The hidden things are the Lord's, but the secret things are the Lord's. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children, and we may do all the words of this law, Deuteronomy 29, 29. So as we come to the doctrine of the Trinity, we keep hitting this, I don't know what's going on here. That's okay. We're not going to be ashamed of that. We're not going to be scared off because people say, well, you don't even understand your own God. Good. <laughs> if we did, he'd be a really puny kind of God. My daughter Haley is here nodding at me and smiling at me. <laughs> she got to talk to some Jehovah's Witnesses today and had a lot of fun. And did we? <laughs> now she's shaking her head. Okay, well, it was fun for us to hear her tell about it. Apparently she was traumatic after the fact for her, but she was very <laughs> faithful in it. So this this is this is one of the first implications of the doctrine that that how God reveals himself is beyond our understanding, and yet nonetheless true. So that's a huge thing to begin with as we come to grips with what Christianity really is. But it's only the beginning, and as apparently we are running out of time, 
this is a good place to stop. And then next mm -hmm. time we will talk more about what it means for God to be three persons and one God. Sounds good. We'll pick up there next week. Snazzy. Snazzy is the word. You know what else is snazzy is you can send us an email at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. You can also check out our show notes for things we reference during the show. Um, and a transcript will shortly be available. We'll see you next time. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. Thanks to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. And we'll see you next time.